Thank you very much. That really was spellbinding there at moments. Overcoats for the relatives of the dead. That's wonderful. Something to think about. Uh, poetry is, as we all know, uh, such a mysterious and wonderful thing. And when it's passed through the, the creator of the poem into words, and then <clears throat> passed again through the mind of somebody like Kurt and so many of us here, <clears throat> It takes on another life, and then when it's read, it takes on another life. And when we hear poems read like this, they take on a life within ourselves that we then take with us. And it's a process that, that is so organic uh, and, and fundamental and essential to the world that we live in, where things are always in motion. And we are just here to observe and learn from what we see. Again, thank you, Kurt. And Ken, thank you very much for a wonderful German version. Well, moving on, uh, now we're going to be delighted with the reading by uh, Jamie Gambrell, who writes about Russian art and culture. She has translated Russian writers whose names I will let her pronounce <laughs> as well as works by Vladimir Zorokin, including most recently The Blizzard. And once again, the books are on the table. If, if you're getting bored with me hearing, say, hearing me say that, uh, I apologize, but we really are interested in uh, promoting the works uh, that our writers have provided. The one-man show Brodsky Baryshnikov premiered in New York this year featuring Jamie's translations of Joseph Brodsky's poetry. And I asked uh, Jamie about that uh, just before we started. That means that she translated the uh, Brodsky's poems, and those were the surtitles that went across the top of the proscenium, proscenium uh, in, the, in the, uh, the theater. And those of us who are translators know how fragile and delicate translation is at the best of times, <clears throat> and if we're translating poetry, we know how important structure is and the lines and the, and the form of, of the poem, whatever that might be. And to think that something that you have translated is going to appear in sort of fragments above the top of a stage without any direct control of which fragments appear at what time and, it, and if there's going to be a, a sort of a sequential uh, harmony that the reader is going to be able to follow. That to me, this is a fascinating media that, uh, that Jamie has worked in. Uh, this spring, uh, Jamie was also awarded the Thornton Wilder Prize for translation, which recognizes a significant contribution to the art of literary translation. Please welcome Jamie Gumbra. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, I'm glad that Tony said something about the uh, brodsky Prushnikov uh, project because I, at the last minute, or last night as I was falling asleep, decided to read one poem from it. It was indeed a great challenge because everyone wanted to watch Prushnikov on the stage, yet if they didn't, and he was reading in Russian. Uh, and so for those people who knew no Russian, they needed something to catch on to. And they had to watch the poem scrolling up into the black space above the stage. And uh, it worked, sort of. <laughs> I'd like to do it over again so that I could fix all the things that I didn't like. So this is a poem that Joseph Brodsky wrote in 1990, and it's um, called Flowers. And it's never been, uh, turned out that it had never been translated into English. And Joseph was very, very particular, I worked with him some, um, that you retain the meter and the rhyme scheme even of the original Russian, uh, something which caused a lot of his critics to 
cringe a little bit um, and made it life difficult with working with him as a translator. And I have not done that in this case at all um, because it, it was because of the context it wouldn't have worked. And those rhyme schemes and meter don't mean the same thing in English that they do in Russian. So we had a difference of opinion on that. But I'm going to read it first in Russian and, um, and then in English. And it's called Flowers. Цветы с их с ума спадящим принципом очертания, придающие воздуху за стеклом пометый вид, за воспаленным А, выглядящим то гортанье, то щепеляве, то просто выкрашенным помадой. Цветы, что хватая паса душу, то жадно, то откровенно, то как блеклые губы, щепчущие, наверное. Чем ближе тело к земле, тем ему интереснее, как сделаны эти вещи, где их, где из подсусторонней ткани они осторожно выкроены, без лезвий. Чем бестелеснее, тем видно одушевленнее, как вариант лица свободного от гримасы, искренности или звезды, отделающейся от массы. Цветы, наконец, вы дома. В вашем нещенном фальше будущем, в прессном стекле пузатых вас, где в пору краснеть, потому что дальше только распад молекул по кличке запах. Или белеть, шепча пестик, тычинка, стебель, сводя с ума штукатурку, опережая мебель. Flowers, whose maddening principle of outlines gives the air behind the glass a rumpled look, their inflamed ah that seems guttural or lisping or simply drawn with lipstick, flowers which grab you by the soul, either frank and greedy or pale like lips whispering probably. The closer the body to earth, the more interesting it finds how they were made. Cut so carefully without a blade from otherworldly fabric, the more incorporeal, incorporeal, the more animate, like a face freed from sincerity's grimace or a star that has rid itself of mass. Flowers, your home at last, in your future, devoid of falsity. It's time to blush because next comes the collapse of molecules known as smell or to fade, whispering, pistol, stamen, stalk, driving the plaster mad, surpassing the furniture. And now, as they say, for something completely different, <laughs> which Marianne knows what I'm talking about, um, I translated a number of novels by the Russian um, writer Vladimir Sarokin, who is always usually introduced with the words controversial um, and, and things like that. He's had uh, his, his um, ups and downs with the powers that be. And this is not his most recent book. Uh, it was published a number of years ago in, in, in Russian. Uh, and, well, the title is self-explanatory, and it's a really wonderful cover. He loved it because it's the feeling of the whole book, I should say, walking into a blizzard. So it starts out like this, and I'm going to be reading little bits through trying to keep a narrative going until I'm told that it's time to stop. You have to understand, I simply must keep going. Platon Ilyich exclaimed angrily. There are people waiting for me. They are sick. There's an epidemic. Don't you understand? The station master, master clenched his fists against his badger fur vest and leaned forward. Well now, what do you mean we don't understand? Of course we do. You don't want to stop. Of course I understand. But I don't got no horses and ain't going to get none until tomorrow. What do you mean you don't have horses? Platon Ilyich cried out in a livid voice. What is your station for, then? 
that's what for. But all of them are out, and there ain't a one to be found nowhere, the station master shouted, as though speaking to a deaf man. Not less some miracle brings the mail horses in tonight, but who knows when they'll get here. Platon Ilyich removed his pince and stared at the station master as though seeing him for the first time. My good fellow, do you comprehend that people are dying? The station ma master unclenched his fist and stretched his hands toward the doctor like a beggar. Who don't understand dying? Of course he does. Good Russian Orthodox people dying. It's a terrible business. But look out the window. Platon Ilyich put his pince back on and automatically turned his puffy eyes towards the frost-covered windows through which nothing could be seen. Outside, the winter day was still overcast. The doctor glanced at the clock, which was shaped like Baba Yaga's hut on chicken legs. It ticked loudly and showed a quarter past two. It's already past two. He indignantly shook his strong, close-cropped head tinged with gray at the temples. Past two o'clock, and it will get dark. Don't you get it? Of course, why wouldn't I be getting it? The station master began, but the doctor interrupted. I tell you what, old man, you get me some horses if you have to dig them up out of the ground. If I don't make it there today, I'll take you to court for sabotage. That familiar government word had a soporific effect on the station master. <coughs> he seemed to fall asleep, all his muttering and explaining coming to an abrupt halt. He wore a short vest, velour pants, and high white felt boots with leather soles sewn on. His body was slightly bent at the waist. He seemed to freeze, remaining immobile in the dim light of the spacious, overheated chamber. On the other hand, his wife, who until now had been sitting quietly and knitting behind a calico curtain in the far corner, turned and peered out, showing her broad, expressionless face, which the doctor had already grown sick of seeing these last two hours of waiting drinking raspberry tea, tea with raspberry and plum jam, and leafing through years old copies of the magazine Niva. Mikhailich, what about asking Kruper? The station master perked up immediately. Hmm, we could try, try Kruper, he said, scratching his left arm. But they want official horses. I don't care what kind of horses they are, the doctor exclaimed. Horses, horses, I want horses. The station master shuffled over to the high counter. Well, Vasya over there. He'll show you the way. Vasya, no one answered his call. Let me see. Excuse me. Let me just see. Ah. No one answered his call. Platon Ilyich Garden, the district doctor, was a tall, sturdy, 42-year-old man with a long, narrow face and a large nose. He was closely shaven and always wore a look of concentrated dissatisfaction. His purposeful face, with its large, stubborn nose and puffy eyes, seemed to say, you are all preventing me from achieving the very important thing I was destined by fate to accomplish, the thing I know how to do better than all of you and to which I've devoted most of my conscious life. In the mudroom, he ran into the station master's wife and Basyatka, who immediately picked up his traveling cases. Let's go, doctor, sir. The doctor followed, puffing at his cigarette. They walked along an empty, snow-covered village street. A good deal of snow had accumulated, and it reached halfway up the doctor's fur-lined boots, knee-high boots. It's coming down hard, Platon Ilyich thought, hurrying to finish his cigarette. What the devil made me take a shortcut through this blasted station? It's a godforsaken place. There are never any horses here in winter. I swore I wouldn't, but no, I had to go this way, Dumkov. If I had taken the high road, I'd have, I'd have changed horses in Zaprudny and driven on. And so what if it's seven versts further? I'd be in Dolga by now. And the station there is well kept, and the road is wide, Dumkov. Now you're out somewhere on a wild goose chase. Hello in there. The doctor followed Vasya in. <clears throat> and then Vasya says, oh, whoops, I can't read this. Excuse me. Ah. Hello, Uncle Kaznot, Vasyatka cried out. There's a doctor here It's in a hurry to get to Dolger, but there ain't no horses at the station. So, he scratched his head. Well, you could take him there on the sledmobile. 
Platon Ilyich walked over to the stove. There's an epidemic in Dolgaya, and I must be there today without fail. Without fail. Epidemic? The bread man rubbed his eyes with, a big, with big calloused fingers that had dirty nails. I heard about it. They was talking about it at the post office in Hakrov yesterday. There are sick people waiting for me. I'm bringing the vaccine. The head on the stove disappeared, the stairs creaked, and Cosma descended in a fit of coughing and came out from behind the stove. He was a short, stunted, skinny, narrow-shouldered man of about 30 with crooked legs and the kind of oversized hands tailors often have. His nose was sharp, his face puffy with sleep. A vaccine, he said respectfully and cautiously, as though he was afraid to drop the word on the floor. A vaccine, the doctor repeated. But there's a blizzard out there, doctor, sir. Cooper glanced at the dimmed window. I know there's a blizzard, and there are sick people waiting for me, the doctor raised his voice. I didn't even fetch the bread today, there's so much snow, Cooper said. He flicked a patch of window where the hoarfrost had melted from the stove's heat and looked out. Look at it out there. How much do you want? The doctor was losing his patience. Cooper looked at him as though he expected to be beaten. He walked silently over to the right of the stove where there were buckets on the bench and shelves with earthenware pots and kettles, picked up a copper ladle, scooped some water out of the bucket, and began to drink so fast his Adam's apple bobbed up and down. Five rubles, the doctor proposed, in such a threatening tone of voice that Cooper flinched. He began to laugh, wiping his mouth with his shirt sleeve. Now what would I be wanting five rubles for? He put the ladle down, looked around, and hiccuped. I, I just fired up the stove. People are dying out there, the doctor shrieked. Your sledmobile, what power is it, the doctor asked him. Fifty horses. Good. We'll be in Dolga in about an hour and a half, and you'll drive back with five rubles. Well, come on now, Your Honor. Cooper smiled, waved his claw-like <clears throat> hand, and slapped himself on his thin haunches. All righty, let's go harness up. The doctor was standing on the stoop, smoking the last of his second papirosa. It's a kind of Russian cigarette. We can go now, Your Honor, sir, Cooper informed him. Thank God, said the doctor, flicking his cigarette butt with an annoyed gesture. Let's be off then. Cooper took one of the doctor's travel bags, and they walked back through the mudroom and into the courtyard and into the sled. Cooper unfolded the bare skin rug. The doctor seated himself, and while Cooper strapped his bags to the coach box in the back, the doctor examined the horses. He had seldom had occasion to see little horses, and it's been mentioned before that each horse is the size of a partridge. <laughs> and while Cooper strapped his bags to the coach in back, the doctor examined the horses. He'd seldom had occasion to see little horses, and even less to travel with them. And though tired from the weight, he regarded them with interest as they stood in five rows under the hood, their little hooves striking the ribbed strip of the frozen drive belt. Small creatures, he thought, and yet they come to our aid in difficult, insurmountable circumstances. How would I have continued on without these tiny beasts? It's strange. All hope now lies with them. No one else will take me to this terrible place, Bolgrea. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie.